do all right, this. All right, all right, all right. Let's do this. I'm like, ready. Ready, Freddie. Okay. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Blair. I'm Kirsten, and we are Mediocre, mediocre content. content. I'm kind of sad. This is like the last Women's History Month episode. It is. It is <laughs> it's indeed. to a close. Um, but you have some happy news, and I have been waiting for a whole week to hear all about it. <laughs> I could not oh, be able to contain myself so waiting. <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell Please. you. Um, so last week, Chris and I went on a cruise. Holla. It was a four day cruise. Mm-hmm. And we went to um, Southern California and Mexico. Beautiful. So mm-hmm. and let me tell you this. <laughs> it's so like comical now that I'm thinking about it. Oh, but it's like, <laughs> this is not the we ha- we did not have a this was my first cruise. First of okay. all, and we all did right. not have a positive cruise experience or I didn't have a positive cruise experience and it's not because I got seasick I just want everyone to know I (laughs) held myself together I was gonna say Chris is on boats so he's probably fine (laughs) so let me tell you so neither of us got seasick that's not why we had a bad time and out of 10 we had a bad time because the weather in Southern California right now is garbage oh yeah I so we traveled to LA and the temperature was like, when we left, it was like 50 degrees, but I'm like, Mm. okay. So, and we kind of looked it up ahead of time and it looked like kind of colder Mm. down in like Mexico and Southern California, which I mean, okay, fine. But I, and people, people from regular parts of the country would be like, Blair, (laughs) it is, Mm -hmm. it is March. Why are you going yeah. on a cruise in March? Well, let me tell you why. Because in Southern California at this time of year, I visited mm-hmm. Southern California in January and it is always 70 degrees and sunny. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All mm-hmm. right. So I, this is not my fault. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't think, not I my don't fault. think anyone's blaming you. <laughs> <laughs> not my fault. How dare so, you? So we get on the ship and we are, let's see. We are unpacked. We're in our little cabin mm, mm-hmm. room, as they call it. Did you have a window? I, we had a balcony. Oh, it was so very nice. nice. It was okay. very nice, except for the fact that it was freaking cold. <laughs> what it a was, beautiful time to have a balcony. <laughs> windy and cold. And like one of the things that I wanted to do on this lovely tropical vacation mm-hmm. that we're taking. Tropical is, like, in quotations. Sit on the balcony of the cruise ship and watch the ocean go by. As you sip your coffee. Yeah. As, yes. Mm-hmm. And could I do that? No, because it was 50 degrees and windy. <laughs> What a glorious time to be alive. Okay, so it's like 5 p.m. We're um we're like still trying to like orient ourselves to the ship. We're like looking at all the fun things there are to do and going mm-hmm. through like the itineraries that they have and all that stuff. Fancy. And in the captain comes on uh, in an announcement and is like, "Hey guys, so tomorrow we're supposed to be going to Catalina Island mm-hmm. off the coast of California and the weather's going to be so shitty that we can't do that." So <laughs> So we basically spend two full days Um, on the ship, like trying to figure out what to do. And there's like a billion people, like not naturally, there was going to be people on the ship, but it's like spring break for LA County. And so like everyone and their children literally are on this Mm -hmm. ship with us. Mm -hmm. And there's lines for everything. Every everything is packed. Nobody's up on like the pool deck area because it's so cold, and the hot tubs are jam packed because like, you know, we can't. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. There's and there's nowhere to go. I'm surprised they didn't like pl- like plan some like last minute things to do for guests that were <laughs> like obviously. Well, and the thing is, is like they. I, they could we could tell they were trying to like boost up the like fun the morale, activities yeah. that you can do but I'm kind of like it's only so much yeah there's a there's only so much and everything was packed like we tried to go see like a comedy show and it was standing room only because so many people like they didn't there's there's nothing else to do right and like mm-hmm. I although I knew I like 
<laughs> it's my first cruise. I didn't realize like how kind of like corny some of it can be. Oh, it, it's insane. It's very like, <laughs> um, like the the cruise director, mm-hmm. super cool guy, very mm-hmm. talented. Seems like he really knows what he's doing. <laughs> but like, oh my god, I, I could not. Yeah. It's so much positivity and so much like it's a little okay, guys. So this is what we're gonna do now, and I'm just like, this is awful. Too much. <laughs> I, I like. I literally, Chris and I were calling it like cruise ship purgatory. Like we were just it stuck is mm-hmm. in cruise ship purgatory for so mm-hmm. long. Luckily. Mm-hmm. Luckily, we were able to make our second stop in Ensenada, Mexico, oh, nice. which was nice. The weather stayed fine for that. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't like tropical or like mm-hmm. lovely, but it was fine. And we were able to go and see that and do a little shopping. I got to have a pina colada out of a pineapple. Oof. So that was nice. Nice. Um, But yeah, it was just. Who did you was... cruise with? Carnival. Ah. And right, mm. right. So, so uh. that's the other thing. That's the other thing. So we, I, Chris had been on a carnival cruise before, like mm-hmm. with his family, and it was like a long time ago. And I didn't want to commit to a cruise that was like, t- mm. you know, ten days or seven days or whatever. It's a and lot. Just in, just in case, like I didn't handle didn't, yeah. the waves or anything well, and like, trust me. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad I started Dramamine like a day before. Yes. And I just like kept on it the whole time. And I did not feel nauseous one time, which, which is, is great. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. But Carnival, yeah. I feel like is not. And it was cheap, right? Like, obviously, we weren't going right. to spend like a, a ton of money just so that we could, you know, right. like, be sick the whole time. Right. Like, no, obviously. that makes sense. But, it's your first one. That, that makes right. perfect yeah. sense. Right. Right. So, yeah, uh, yeah it was not. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I I will say that yeah. um I would be willing to try again because obviously mm-hmm. there were some unforeseen circumstances in terms of like right. the weather and I talked to a lady on the cruise who was like, "Yeah, we took the same cruise in January last year and it was so fun and mm-hmm. like the weather was great and blah 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 and I'm like, "Well, this is dumb." <laughs> um <laughs> crap. <laughs> so basically Like there were some things that we couldn't control that I don't think gave cruising a fair shot. Yeah. But I need to take a break for at least a couple of years because (laughs) I am emotionally traumatized by this whole thing. Oh my gosh. I don't even remember. I'm trying. I'll have to ask Tyler. I don't even remember what cruise line we took, but there was so much space. There was so many places to be, so many different areas of the ship to be. And even though I unfortunately was sick the entire eight days, um, in general, the ship did not feel cramped. I felt like I could walk forever and not run into a crowd of people. So oh. it, I don't <laughs> think, unless it was just, I don't know. I, I really don't think it was carnival, but but maybe it will. I don't remember. It was such a long time ago now. But I, I'm glad that you were not sick because that is literally the worst. And it is the worst. We really were like, uh, this was not planned by me at all. This was like planned by his mom at the time. Uh-huh. <laughs> it really was eight days of like H E double hockey sticks. Oh god! <laughs> like the the <laughs> islands were gorgeous. I don't regret right. looking at the places and being involved right. with the people and the food was amazing. Like. That part, 10 mm-hmm. out of 10 recommend. The cruising part <laughs> was, right. and I had the Dramamine patch. So you yeah. would think that that would be enough. I was just sick <laughs> yeah. the whole time. Oh, oh my God. And did you, I, um, go ahead. Sorry. Did you feel sick after you got off the boat? Because that's what happened to me. No. Well, so I felt like after the same day. So like mm-hmm. we, we, um, Debarked. Mm-hmm. Is that how the term? <laughs> I guess. We got off the boat. We got dis- <laughs> debarked. Dis- 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 <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. So we got off yeah. the boat on a Friday. That rest of the day we spent like driving back up to mm-hmm. Monterey. And it was, let's see. Um, so I definitely had moments where I was like, my Still brain was floating. like catching up yeah. with my ears, you know, like mm-hmm. I- the so equilibrium felt, yeah kind, yeah it was a little weird yeah but I never I never once felt like I was gonna Sick. vomit yeah yeah that's good that's good yeah felt like we got our sea leg well 
sea legs in quotations for those who can't see it, but I got my sea legs and then I got home and I remember I was unpacking and I was like, I am going to be sick. Yeah. (laughs) Like I am on land. And I'm going to be sick. Yeah. And of course, here's Chris the whole time, who's just like <laughs> in the Navy and the like optimist does, does, like lives on boats for a living and mm-hmm. all this stuff. And he's like, it's not that bad. This, this is, is wonderful. actually okay. And I'm like, babe, I love you so much, but this is the worst. This whole cabin is bigger than my bunk. <laughs> yeah. Um, <sighs> And yeah. the other thing is, so like, you know how they do, um, like the dining. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was that bad. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, we don't want your two cents. Get out of so, here. Sea man. <laughs> so we, so you know how you have to do like the group dining, like you, so there's options yeah. for dining, right? So there's like the buffet thing. And mm-hmm. then there's like the specialty restaurants that you have to pay extra for. And then mm-hmm. there's like the dining experience where they match you up with potentially four random people on the oh. boat. That you, yeah. So like, I didn't we, know that. Okay. Yeah. So there's like the formal dining, which is like, they have round tables and mm-hmm. they match you up with two other couples from because there was only two of us like if we had had like a family or something it would have been different but they matched us up with two other couples for dinner and like in theory you're Mm -hmm. supposed to eat dinner with these people every night and like socialize and it's like a nice way to like bring the cruise ship together blah 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 sure so we didn't go the first night because we wanted to try one of the restaurants but we went the second night Mm -hmm. and you know we had been like drinking and having a nice little time (laughs) and we get to the table and there's one couple is on their honeymoon both for their second marriages oh and they have four kids between the two of them and they don't drink (laughs) meanwhile we're like oh yeah neither do with me it's fine we don't drink it's not us us and our two cats have definitely never had a drink at all (laughs) no right and then um so we're we're in the appetizer and mm-hmm. the the second couple comes, they like make it to dinner mm-hmm. and they are sick. Like <gasps> they in like they just got really nauseous and like don't handle boats well. Oh. And they're both like smelling like the smelly the salt, stuff. Yeah. yeah. And they don't feel well at all. Um, but they just wanted to like come to um, see, yeah. you know, try and get a little bit of food or whatever. And they seem very nice, but they are also, they also are on their second marriages on their second honeymoon (laughs) and also have four kids. And Chris and I are looking at each other like, we have less in common with these people. That's what brings you together. Yeah. And so then we spend the rest of the time trying to avoid them like on the Mm -hmm. boat Mm -hmm. and like, because we don't want to talk to them. And so we never go back to dinner after that. We like, perfect. yeah. And yeah, it's, it's what a great time. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, it really brought us together as a couple trying to avoid these other couples. These other couples. Oh my god. <laughs> what a beautiful experience. Well, d- how about this? I will bite the bullet and I will just, you know, drug myself on Dramamine for months prior. We will do a cruise together <laughs> to I was so better hoping that you would say that. I really feel like <laughs> I really feel like the redeeming <sighs> factors, like the only way that I think I could do this again is a, yeah. take a different cruise line and Absolutely. B, um, and B take another couple mm-hmm. like with us. So, right. Yeah. Because it's yeah. so like, we had a nice time together. And I think if the right. itinerary would have been the same and we would have been able to get off the boat, because mm-hmm. like by far the best day was the day that we got to go to Mexico and like right. look around and see the things and, mm-hmm. you know, it, but like, yeah. So I think it would have been better for a lot of reasons, but I think sure. those are the two things that I would rather change for the I next agree. one if we and decide to. Honestly, I, I I'm traumatized the other way. I I spent too much time on the boat, and I think yeah. that's really what screwed me for my first time. So I would also be willing. Like it still makes me anxious because I don't really like being out at sea. But I understand. I, understand. I feel like I was also was a little bit a little anxious. anxious. I was like. <laughs> Titanic I too. I slept so well. <laughs> I mean, I tell, the the the, the rocking, rocking of the boat is like <laughs> I have never slept so good in my life. Oh, I'm so happy. Yeah, I think honestly, if it was a shorter amount of time for me, and then a different cruise line for you, I honestly feel like you'd have a great time. Yeah, 
Yeah. So maybe we'll have to plan that. We were okay. talking about that the whole time. We were like, we need to take <laughs> Kirsten and Tyler on vacation. Oh like they God. need to come on vacation with us. We are definitely in need of vacation, but well, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, obviously. I mean, we'll both think about it this way. We'll both be moving at the same time. It's in well theory. true. We'll we'll discuss that offline actually oh, because yeah, I okay. have All right. to, to add to All that. Right. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> <clears throat> it's fine it's fine one day we'll Sorry, have a listener. station together no you're not you're not privy to this yeah. confidential information you can't you can't know this stuff yeah. <laughs> any hoodle that's awesome all I'm right glad it wasn't too too bad though no like, it wasn't the worst the most I think it would have been the worst if I would have been nauseous the entire the time. whole time yes yeah yeah um but I think I think when it's all said and done, it was not the worst it could have no. been. It was just not ideal. Right. It definitely, there were absolutely room for improvement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so okay. anyway, let's get this show on the road. <laughs> shall we? Longest intro in a long time. I love I it. Know, I know. <laughs> Fantastic. This is what happens when we don't talk for two hours before. No, it's very true. Uh, we really did just jump in because I just wanted to hear it and I felt like it needed to be recorded. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> little disclaimer before we get going, Always, as yes. per usual, um, we are not experts on anything. If you have come to this podcast to get any kind of advice, we are not the place for that. Um, but we are the place to learn things, <clears throat> to learn about things you may not have otherwise known about. Mm -hmm. And we encourage you to do your own research and learn along with us. So exciting. <clears throat> Kirsten, take it away. Okay. Good news. Here we go. I also want to preface that as usual, I am who I am. And these are science related pieces of good news as per usual. Kirsten Science Corner. Science. That's what, you know what? We should really just call it the Science Corner. <laughs> we should. Rebrand. <laughs> Rebranding. Quarter two. Here we go. Um, okay. So the first one might be a little controversial because I know that there are um, differences in opinion on the use of AI these days. Mm -hmm. uh, I myself do find some of its uses a little bit uh, unhinged. Um, <laughs> but it's, 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 um, it's, it's unknown territory. You know um, what yeah. I mean? Like it's a little, everyone's a little bit like, are we sure we want to do this? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've all seen iRobot. So this is, this is where we are. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> anyway, um, but this does have to do with AI software working in a really brilliant way. So recently in Hungary, there are early testing results that show that artificial intelligence, which is AI, has impressive ability to detect signs of breast cancer that may have been missed by doctors, which is huge. Huge. Um I feel terrible because pronunciation is always uh, the lackluster part of me speaking, but the Chiron Medical Technologies feeds its AI systems millions of mammograms from patients who were diagnosed or who are known to have breast cancer, and as well as images labeled by radiologists to teach the AI how to detect that cancerous growth. Um, as some people may not be aware, this has to do with shapes, locations, cell densities. There's lots of indicators that doctors and radiologists are looking for to try and detect these cancerous masks. By then, what they'll do is create a mathematical representation of what a normal mammogram would look like. Mm. And essentially, again, you're teaching this AI system how to detect the difference between something that looks normal and is normal compared to the other abnormalities I just talked about. So in 2022, after testing more than 275,000 breast cancer cases, Chiron said that AI technology can spot the cancer at least as well as doctors at the second reader of scans. Um, as the second reader of scans, pardon me. Uh, additional testing at the clinic in Hungary found that AI software was able to identify more malignancies, <laughs> to be job. careful with Good the pronunciation, uh, increasing the cancer detection rate by 13%. Fantastic. And the technology is meant to be used alongside the doctor and more clinical trials are obviously needed. However, this is fantastic news, even though the technology itself is a little controversial right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, I like that they're using it alongside, alongside. doctors yes. because- Although this is good for, mm -hmm. you know, a primary assessment, I right. feel like it's always good because humans, 
have you know, a margin for error, but Mm -hmm. also there are things that our bodies do that are maybe not always textbook. So I think it's good to also have a physician look at it. So that's nice. And of course, as the article did denote, depending on ethnicity, your age, what kind of body composition you have, I mean, all of those are particulars to the human. So it sometimes would take a human eye to be able to identify, oh, well, in this region, you may have more or less susceptibility to this. You know, it just depends on all those things that AI can eventually learn, but it's not fail proof. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Good news in the breast cancer research world. (laughs) We love it. We do. Uh, And I also thought it was appropriate for Women's History Month. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Very topical. Um, Yeah. All right. And then my second piece of good news has to do with the ocean. The United Nations uh, have now agreed to take historic this historic treaty um, that is working to protect marine life and biodiversity across all world oceans. So this isn't just one location. This is all oceans. Um, This treaty marks a long awaited milestone in years of the longstanding effort to safeguard planet seas. And the UN says that high, the high seas treaty, which is what it's actually called would place 30% of the world's ocean into protected areas put more money into the conservation of marine life and covers access to and use of marine genetic resources. This treaty would also put limits on fishing, the routes of shipping lanes that are happening, you know, with imports, exports, cruise lines, any of those things, all as well as exploration activities in deep sea mining. The high seas Uh, which is every area that lies about 200 nautical miles beyond a nation's territorial waters are often called the world's last true wilderness. Is this a lot we haven't explored in the ocean? That's just the truth. But what we have explored and what we are trying to save is around that area for sure and outward. And they make up more than 60% of the world's oceans. Uh, The 30% of the high seas that would now be covered is a major jump from the prior legislation, which was from 1982, called the Convention of the Law of the Sea, which protected just 1.2% of oceans. So this is, I know. So you take that 1.2 and we're now jumping to 30%. I mean, that's massive. We love Yeah, We love that. So all in all, great news. Hopefully, um, this does some good and they've got some good plans in place to make it happen and make it viable. Because I know that a lot of the times people always ask, like, you're putting this in place and it's supposed to be good for the planet, which is all well and good. But how does modern society still function? Obviously, if you're inputting, um, you know, new routes that can't be accessed or new routes that have to be, um, you know, adjusted, how does that work, you know, territory wise between the country? Like there's a lot of questions and and they're fair questions. So I'm sure they're working those out and making sure that, you know, life pretty much goes on as normal for the rest of us too. Absolutely. That's what I got. I've been, (laughs) I've been thinking about like the depths of the sea recently. Obviously you've been in the depths of the sea. I know. Well, yes. Okay. (laughs) Fair. And I didn't, I was very disappointed. And like, I understand that like whales don't really hang out like very far out there, but I was very disappointed that I didn't see a whale or a dolphin or anything. And it's very upsetting. <laughs> I'm anyway, so sorry. That was like the tagline. And I didn't see a whale the whole time. I, I know. I, was out I there. know. <laughs> but also, we've been watching The Mandalorian, and like the uh, new season mm-hmm. has like all of these really weird aquatic creatures. I feel like the giant creatures that I'm seeing on The Mandalorian makes mm-hmm. me think about the creatures that we have not yet discovered in the That's ocean. And it kind of trips me out a little bit. Like, obviously, I don't. <laughs> I don't think that anything like any large aquatic mammal right. could survive at the depths of the ocean, but you never know. You never know. That's why we're science babies. That's right. <laughs> oh man. So anyway, okay. to the women. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I have no segues. So here we go. Um, insert clever segue here. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. So today, as you know, by the title, we are talking about Julia Child mm. and I am so excited to talk about her. We Kirsten also wanted to do her. And I then did. we decided she's going to do Mother Earth instead. And <laughs> which I think was still a good which choice. Was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But I am super excited to talk about her <clears throat> and you'll see why I um, had a small obsession 
<laughs> a while ago. But um, anyway, so her original name is Julia Carolyn McWilliams. She was born August 15th, 1912 in Pasadena, California, and passed away on August 13th. <gasps> 2004. I didn't know. She was Isn't so that... close. I know. Isn't that wild? You know, that... that kind of reminds me of everybody putting that article out about the queen and then she passes away. I know. God I know. Her. Oh, wild. that's close. She lived a very long life, though. Yeah. And um, she did a lot in her yeah. in her career and her life. So she <clears throat> the first we like really know I mean, she grew up in Pasadena, California. Um, we, she graduated from Smith College in 1934 with a Bachelor of Arts. And Smith College, for those who may have been listening to our Sweetbriar episode, is a really well-renowned all-female college. And back then, like, that was the way things were done is, like, mm-hmm. men went to their own college and then women had, like, a separate college. But still, regardless, it was a really good education that she received, Mm -hmm. which is uncommon for some, for a female in that time. Mm -hmm. And, um, she worked occasionally in advertising. Um, and then in 1942, eager, eager to help the country's war efforts in world war two, Julia is hired as a typist for the U S information agency in Washington, DC. That's amazing. She then, she then transferred to the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, the forerunner to the CIA. So this was before the CIA was even a thing. <clears throat> yes, I'm listening to you. My okay. mom just tried to FaceTime me. <laughs> and I have to tell her we're mom, recording. <laughs> we're doing something. I'm here. just going to check on her and make sure she's okay. She, uh, mom, I'm so sorry. She lost, they lost their cat this week. And so it's oh, been a really rough week no. at the house. Yeah. So I, <laughs> Anyway, she just tried to face me, so I'm just checking to make sure everything's okay. <laughs> We're sorry, chicken mom, about the cat. Yes. Anyway, uh, the war. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyway, the OSS is the forerunner to the IC, the ICA, the CIA, <laughs> the ICA, <laughs> IC. Yeah, yeah. So the CIA doesn't exist at this time. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So then she gets a different job as the first. Uh, a research assistant mm-hmm. in the secret intelligence division and later a re- a researcher helping to develop shark repellent which was a critical tool because sharks would sometimes set off explosives intended for german oh, u-boats oh no that's i so didn't know sad. shark repellent was a thing but i feel like they should sell it like insect repellent just like <laughs> all no. right it's sadder that they were exploding i know talk about know. marine biology curious. protection <laughs> they're curious little you know oh, they're yeah. like let me just touch and then all of a sudden yeah. <laughs> it's like finding nemo all over again i know oh. so anyway so she worked with the oss for a while um <clears throat> and let's see so in her book my life in france her memoir Mm-hmm. Um, she says I was too tall for the WACs and the waves, but eventually joined the OSS and set out into the world looking for adventure. Aww. And she met her husband in the OSS, Paul, Paul. and they got married <laughs> in 1945. So, so. cute. Yes. <laughs> and with his job is where our story really begins because he got stationed in Paris for six <laughs> years after the war. Wow. And this is where she attended Le Cordon Bleu, which is a very famous French cooking school so and cool. became the Julia Child we know and love today. I love it so much. <laughs> I know. I know. So, um, <clears throat> She so the funny part is is that in 1949 she officially enrolled and she started in the quote unquote housewife level class mm. and she was like no 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 this is not for me I want to do something more with my life mm-hmm. and so <clears throat> she joined the another class which was the cuisine course for experts and it was a year long program for professional restaurant tours with and the class was. Ex- 
exclusively former GIs. And there was 11 of them and then one Miss Julia Child. <laughs> she squeaked on him. <laughs> she did. She did. Um, she did have to take the final exam twice. And mm-hmm. in the movie, Julie and Julia, which we'll talk about in a minute, they kind of allude to the fact that mm-hmm. uh, the lady who ran the school did not like her very much. Yeah. Um, so she gave her a really hard, like, final exam first, and then she had to retake it to get mm-hmm. her, li- her license or um, certificate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that I cannot confirm or deny that in the <sighs> official Julia Child website. Yeah. They did not confirm indicate that yeah but yeah. i mean i feel like that's tea anyway um <clears throat> she and her two french friends simone beck and louise Bertot, in 1951 founded the school of three gourmands which there's the french like pronunciation for that kirsten you want to give it a try or do you want me to try it because i don't I think, think I it's le col de trois gourmands if i'm not mistaken but it has been a very long time. <laughs> I never took French, French, so I, yeah, <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah, of course. Um, and later, the three of them wrote the best-selling cookbook, "Mastering the Art of French Cooking," volumes one and two, which is praised for its clarity and comprehensiveness. And I do own volume one, mm-hmm. and it is very comprehensive. Let me tell you. <laughs> It's, I think that's the thing. She simplified everything so much because I feel like she jumped into it and she's like, no, everybody yeah. needs to be able to. <laughs> like, yes. And it's very, things. it's very helpful. Yeah. Like there's a lot of really nice pictures and drawings yeah. and, um, but it's a thick boy. Let me uh, tell well, you. Yeah. It is she's a got a lot of content. Book. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the book, however, like she left Paris Mm -hmm. without like publishing the book Mm -hmm. so they moved back to Cambridge Massachusetts in 1961 her and her husband um Louise Louisette and Simone stayed in Paris and um they continued to visit Europe regularly they had a home in the south of France which I mean that's amazing yeah and um She then, I think it was like nine years after she left Paris that they eventually um, published the book. Nice. But while they were in Boston or like in Cambridge, a promotional appearance on television led to an offer to host a cooking show on Boston's public television station. The French chef premiered in 1962. So I think the book was published in 1961. Mm -hmm. So then with the success of the book, then came the TV show, which you can still watch online. So cute. And it's very cute. Um, Let's see. So 1962. And then um, the, show was on for 206 episodes um it is credited with convincing the american public to try cooking french food at home and with her humor exuberance and unpretentiousness julia became an unlikely star yeah i think that's really the kicker like yeah she's not there to like impress you and like be the best she's literally there just to teach you how to cook (laughs) right and like there are stories of her you know making mistakes in the kitchen and being like it's fine don't worry about it just like keep going (laughs) the bob ross of cooking and just a happy little accident it's just just a happy little accident (laughs) um yeah and by the way this woman is six feet two inches tall she is a very tall lady and um yeah, she just she's a lovely she she at least comes off as a lovely human being. I think from what I've done in my research for this adorable Absolutely. Meryl Streep does a great job like impersonating her on yes. or like acting as her. I don't know if impersonating is the right word, but on acting. in the movie yeah. St- with Stanley Tucci. Job. Oh, <laughs> God. It's They're so always movie, so good together. <laughs> that movie is like one of my favorite movies. Yes. It's so good. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's amazing. So because of all this work that she's done, like she's, Mm -hmm. she's done quite a bit. Um, she was the recipient of numerous honors during her career, including a Peabody award in 1964 an Emmy award in 1966 and a national book award in 1980. 
She was appointed the French Legion of Honor in 2000 and received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2003. Wow. And a portion of her of her kitchen and some of her kitchen implements were put on the display at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. Which is so you can so cool. see those there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She has written a lot of books too. Like mm. on the Julia Child Foundation website, um, they have all of her books for sale. And there's like a lot. I didn't mm-hmm. realize. Um, so obviously Mastering the Art of French Cooking, volumes one and two, but then also she has the French Chef Cookbook, which is based on her show. And then she published a memoir, memoir called My Life in France, which mm. like basically covers those six years that they lived in Paris. So cute. Um, so Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. Um, they have a podcast. It's called Inside Julia's Kitchen. And the found- foundation uses it to highlight today's food culture. Interesting. I kind of want to check into that. That would be cool. They've got like 180 episodes, something like that. Um, A lot. I tried to look to see if there were any like, like people Mm -hmm. that you would know, right? On like as guests and stuff. And it seems like pretty niche, to be honest. It doesn't seem like not surprising pop culture, you know. Um, but definitely worth checking out if you're into it. And um, you can also get a award called the Julia Child Award given to you by the foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, And the Julia Child Award is given to any individual or team who has made a profound and significant difference in the way America cooks, eats, and drinks. Do you know anybody who's received this award? Like, is or is this like a I ranking? Looked. They have a list. They have <laughs> oh, a list. okay. <laughs> and it's not any of the celebrity chefs you're thinking oh, of right no. now, or anyone on the Food Network. So sorry, sorry, about Gordon. It. <laughs> yeah. Um. Again, very niche. Very like, niche. You have to be in the restaurant, like, okay, that realm. I think of people to know who they are. Mm-hmm. Um. The foundation presents the annual award in association with the Smithsonian, the association with the Smithsonian, <laughs> the Smithsonian National Museum of American <sighs> History at a gala event in Washington D.C. in the fall. Oh, the gala is a celebration of the recipients' accomplishments and helps raise money to support the support food history programming at the museum. And it features prominent speakers from throughout the national food world. And kicks off the museum's annual Smithsonian Food History Week. That's adorable. I would Indeed. also like to know all of the people who have spoke. I wonder if they are also as niche. <laughs> I, I believe they are. And yeah. you, the prize for the award, like I think you get like a little trophy or something, but then you mm-hmm. also get $50,000 of money donated to your favorite like food charity. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. Yeah. Aww. Well, so it's it's lovely. We're we lovely. I think we have a lovely person to profile this week. I'm oh, there. She's just the best. Yeah, she really is. This is very exciting. Um, but I'm ready to talk about the movie, honestly. So yeah. can we give them a break? <laughs> yes, they deserve a break, and we will be right back. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Blair. Do you have cats? Why, yes, I do. Then you should play mediocre content for your cats. And why is that? Because it has been shown to soothe cats and reduce hairballs. Really? Yes. In fact, I play mediocre content for my cats, too. Mediocre content is for all pets. That's so great to know. I will play mediocre content for my cats right now. You should. Everyone should listen to mediocre content with their pets today. Mediocre content has not been shown to reduce hairballs or soothe any animals of any species. In fact, it's very probable to create the exact opposite effect. Please use caution while exposing your furry friends to mediocre content. It's also pretty dodgy for humans to listen at your own risk. New Yorker content is not responsible for any negative effects of podcast listening. Welcome back. (laughs) That's terrible. I'll never do that again. (laughs) (laughs) This is not like a game show. Welcome back, everyone. (laughs) No. To Iron Chef. No. No. (laughs) No. (laughs) <laughs> definitely not oh my gosh i do remember watching a segue talking about the iron chef because now you've got me thinking about it mm-hmm. when i was growing up i used to watch um the japanese version of iron chef with suzanne mm. <laughs> and it was, this was like i think i don't remember where we where she was living maybe new jersey i don't even remember if she listens to these but uh i think bill does but uh i'd love to confirm that because i used to 
lay in her bed and play with her cats and we would watch the Japanese version of Iron Chef. I love that. Mm-hmm. That is family bonding. Masa- Masaharu Morimoto is still the goat. Okay. I, yeah, I've, I know that name. I, have I know heard that name before. <laughs> He's still the one. Anyway, back to Julia, I guess. <laughs> Julia. Okay, so we're going to talk about the best movie surrounding <laughs> food and having two female leads probably ever. Oh my gosh, um, wait, I have to pause you again. I'm so oh sorry. No. What's wrong? <laughs> you also made me think of that. <laughs> so recently, like within the last 48 hours, Tyler came across the movie The Menu. Have you seen that? Mm-mm. He thought it was a comedy. And for anyone who doesn't know, it is not a comedy. <laughs> it is a horror movie, essentially, Oh, where this super amazing chef kills a bunch of rich people. So spoiler alert, it's insane. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And you just made me think about it. That's amazing. Okay. Now back to Julia. I love it that our husbands are trying to traumatize us with the movies they make us watch. I need to stop this. It's off. All right. For girl. Interstellar. Truly terrible. Oh my God. <laughs> we'll just, we'll just breeze on by it anyway. Oh, okay. All right. <clears throat> best movie so, ever. Julie and Julia. Best yes. movie ever. Um. So the basic plot is Mm. julie is played by amy adams so cute she is working in a post 9 11 new york and her job is like pretty mundane and she works in a cubicle and she's listening to people complain all day so like her life is not special Mm -hmm. and the whole premise of the movie for her character is to like overcome this feeling of just awfulness Mm -hmm. and make every recipe in the in mastering the art of french cooking cookbook Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she starts a blog about it and becomes basically internet famous Mm -hmm. or what was internet famous at the time and then in in sequence with that you see julia's life and Mm -hmm. her struggles moving to paris and not knowing what to do and going through um, Le Cordon Bleu and, you know, kind of developing her career. Mm-hmm. Um, and Stanley Tucci plays her husband and it's totally adorable. Iconic duo for the- Yes. Right. And and Amazing. Julia is played by Meryl Streep, obviously. I think. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And it's just, it's, it's everything. And it's very much a- um, it's about that time in your life. Like the underlying mm-hmm. theme, in my opinion, is like, it's about that time in your life where you're kind of like transitioning. You don't yes. know like what you're doing, but you decide to make a change in your life and it like works out for the better and you grow from it. And it's just a beautiful thing. Yes. And also the other piece that I like is that they are both in different sections of their life experiencing this transition, like yes. different times in their life, like not the same age, not the same experience. And also, if I'm not mistaken, they both kind of go through like relationship, like especially Julie, she goes through like this whole relationship awakening with her I don't know if he was just a boyfriend or a fiance at the time, but he's husband. He's husband. husband. So mm-hmm. you you see the dynamic of, you know, that transition as well and the very human struggles that you're experiencing as you're trying to find your way and establish yourself for yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, It's, it's just a beautiful movie. Mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, like, so I believe part of what makes this a beautiful movie is the fact that it was directed by Nora Ephron. And I don't know if you guys know who that is, but she has directed iconic movies like You've Got Mail and Sleeps in Seattle, which are, you know, 90s Mm rom-coms basically. But they have this like something else to it. It's like a comfort almost. Yeah. They're real. Yes. Yeah. And I love, I love You've Got Mail. It's Mm -hmm. like, one of my top 10 like favorite movies nice and so anyway and then she also wrote the screenplay for when harry met sally so cute she's got 
Um, She's got credentials. Yes. Yes. And <laughs> receipts. So, but I think that's like what added the little like comfort, like mm-hmm. the the extra zhuzh that like made yeah. this movie beautiful. Agreed. Um, so in the movie, I have a little piece of trivia, which I found on the IMDb page. <laughs> and <clears throat> so a little piece of trivia. So in the movie, during the Valentine's Day dinner, um, one of the guests guests asked Julia and Paul if they were spies in the war, right? Because like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they kind of worked for like the pre CIA, blah, blah, blah. Right. And both of them deny this at the time, the modern half of the film was set and child's wartime files had not been declassified. Oh, by the time the film itself was made, in 2009 their records had been made public and it was revealed that julia had served as a top secret researcher for the oss the filmmakers elected to go only with the facts that were established knowledge in 2002 but the spy conversation was thrown in as a slide nod toward the later revelation that's amazing i love that yeah so So. sneaky i know i just thought that was kind of fun (laughs) um so um after I watched this for the first time, well, I think it was like I rediscovered it in mm-hmm. lockdown. You know, mm-hmm. I was like watching a bunch mm-hmm. of things and, you know, I was working at the hospital and I was like not feeling great yes. about that. And so I started an Instagram account that you can still look up right now. It's called Mental Bake Down. Because <laughs> that's what we were all going through. <laughs> yes, exactly. And my goal at the time was to, you know, do like cook through the entire cookbook right Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I thought that that was a reasonable expectation working 12 hour shifts three to four days a week and it was not so it turns out and like and like yeah it was not great so I made a few recipes Mm -hmm. um I'll tell you which ones I made (laughs) I let's see so I made tomatoes a la Provencal, basically like tomatoes with breadcrumbs on top. Gorge. It was very good. And I made her scalloped potato recipe. Mm. Also good. Love potatoes. I made the asparagus recipe. Love asparagus. And let's see. I also made a quiche. Ooh. (laughs) A spinach and cheese quiche. And then I also made, let's see canapé which is spinach cheese butter more breadcrumbs on like (laughs) toast and then I love how like butter heavy everything is oh girl (laughs) butter Um, bread butter and then I tried to make a chocolate souffle which it was okay (laughs) I I kind of failed it didn't have cheese didn't have spinach so (laughs) it was it deflated rather quickly. Oh no. Um, but it tasted okay. And I made homemade whipped cream. Beautiful. So that was fun. Mm. And then and then I stopped after that. <laughs> and then I just derailed. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Uh, at least you tried. I tried. I tried. It's more than I've done. Um, there's also a random picture of some rice krispie treats that I was proud of that I made. And with nothing also, to do with the cookbook. <laughs> and also um banana bread, I think. Oh. Tyler loves banana bread. Yeah. A long time since I made that. Mm. So anyway, that I might pick that up maybe one day, but today is not that day. Definitely um, not. <laughs> my so next yeah. mental bake. I, it was also my like attempt at like trying to love cooking because I freaking <sighs> hate cooking. Me too. That's why we have air fryers, Blair. That's right. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's why we have air fryers. Like, I I know this about myself. Like, I'm just yeah. not like, I like to bake during the holidays, but other than that, I am not like, I can't, I hate making dinner every night. So I me like too. meal prep all the time because I yeah. can't. It drives me crazy. It's awful. So, um, yeah, I, it's, it's not for me. It's not for me, but it could be for you. So <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see. So we covered that and So I just wanted to say a little bit about why I think Julia Child is like the perfect end to our Women's History Month series. And I 
so and we've kind of already touched on this like a teensy bit but yeah. like she was first of all she is six foot two <laughs> she she <laughs> lives in she lived in a time period or was like starting to live her life in a time period of like the 1950s and 60s which is not mm-hmm. the most inclusive for mm-hmm. women she had an incredibly like um like different life like she didn't right. follow the train that right. everybody else did and i think she got married like pretty late in life mm-hmm. and she was older when she went to go to the mm-hmm. cordon bleu and did all of these major life changes like she was not 20 yep. you know And so I think that teaches us two things. One, you can do whatever you want, regardless of what age you are, which I think is important, especially for women, because I feel like they like society likes to put us in little Mm -hmm. boxes, you know, like, okay, Mm -hmm. so you go to college and then after college, you get married. And then after you get married, you wait like a year, maybe like less than a year and you have a child and then you Mm -hmm. have a second child and then your life becomes as a mom. And you're just, and after that, it's it's like all like planned out for you. Right. Right. And so I feel like it's important to realize that it doesn't have to be that planned out. Like do what you want to do when you want to do it. It doesn't matter. Right. Agree. There are no rules. It's all made up. Okay. (laughs) The points don't matter. (laughs) The points don't matter. (laughs) Uh, whose line um, is in anyway is great exactly <laughs> so um and in addition to that like she went to a predominantly like she was in the the male like the professional cooking class and she was mm-hmm. the only woman and the lady who ran the school was probably not her best friend yeah, <laughs> probably not um she had to take the final exam twice it took her nine years to get her cookbook published so like she kept going and I think that's important too like it's always a good lesson it's always good to be reminded that like even if it doesn't come easy it's always good to keep persevering and Mm -hmm. like do what do your best like live your dreams like yeah corny motivational poster inserted here you know what I mean (laughs) I mean failure is learning that's what like you're not failing you're just learning something new to apply at your next try like it's just it is what it is yeah yeah um, and most importantly, she uh, let Americans know the importance of butter, which I think is really like it makes everything taste better. It's probably not that great for your arteries, but like it's fine. It's good. It's OK. It's OK. It's OK. Yeah. Butter okay is in great. moderation. Mm-hmm. Butter is good. Love butter. Yeah. And yeah. cooking for yourself is good, even though I don't like it. I really don't. I'm trying similar train. I have tried the air fryer makes it a little bit better, but something about like getting off of work and then having another task just makes me want to like pull my hair out. I know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Julia's great. I, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's my spiel. What do you, do you have anything else to add? Do you, what do you think? No, I think that was lovely. I love that this is how we ended as well. I think she's a great one to end on for all of those reasons and more. And for the listener, if you haven't seen Julie and Julia, highly recommend the movie. Definitely. Um, even if you're not into cooking, it's not just, it's not about cooking, honestly. It's, it's, it's it has, not. It has little to do with just cooking and the overall theme is there. Highly recommend a watch. Yeah, um, but that's all I wanted to add. Other than that, uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> Great. So, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, come back next week for something not related to Women's History Month. Yes, and we'll surprise you with some fun. Yeah. Topics. And if you have topics or questions that you'd like to send our way, you can always do that at our email, which is mediocrecontentpodcast at gmail.com. You can also connect with us over on Twitter at Mediocre Squawks or Instagram at Mediocre Content Podcast. And I guess we'll see you in April. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>